James and Vivian Gray had what everybody wants. They'd been happily married for 40 years, had successfully transitioned into a comfortable retirement, and were looking forward to living out their lives together in Sadieville, Kentucky, healthy and happy. They had both worked hard to get here, purchasing property and saving their money as they progressed through the years. Their assets totaled over half a million dollars. James had retired from IBM and Vivian had been a part-time teacher. Upon his retirement, James opened a sort of antique junk shop across the street from their home. The shop was called Gray on Main. It was a quaint second-hand shop that sold a variety of items. One item that didn't seem to be quite as quaint were the guns that were available for sale. But their business was legitimate, and they followed all laws in the sale of the guns. James was careful about that. A business associate, Jason Linville, described them as good people who would often offer a hand to people who came into their shop to sell items to them. They were good people and had built a good life. Their only sorrow was their son, James Anthony Gray. Everyone called him Anthony. Now a man, Anthony continued to be their biggest heartbreak. This son would be the death of them. Ring around the rosy, a pocket full of posies. Ashes, ashes, we all fall down. (laughs) Welcome to the Parasite Podcast. I'm Sherry. And I'm Marie. And this episode is the story of James and Vivian Gray and how their son, Anthony, murdered them. On April 26, 2007, Jody Lucas called 911 at 9.43 a.m. She was in a panic, telling the dispatcher that her father had been shot, and she couldn't find her mother. She needed the police to come right away. She said she had a gun that she could go get if they wanted her to go back into the house. Strangely, the dispatcher did not discourage her, telling her that she could do what she wanted. Seems dangerous. And really weird for a dispatcher. It does. Wisely, Jody did not re-enter the home. She waited for the emergency responders. So wait, I thought Anthony was an only child. Who is Jody? Jody Lucas wasn't their biological daughter, and she wasn't their adopted daughter either. But she was their daughter. They called her their daughter, and she called them her parents. Sometimes the family picks you, even if it isn't really your family, and that's pretty much what had happened in this case. Jody had moved into the area around 2002, and she became friends first with James, the dad. Mm -hmm. He used to go to garage sales and to estate sales, and he would run into her there, and they became friendly. And pretty soon he said, why don't you just ride along with me every weekend? We can go to these garage sales together. Well, that's nice. Mm -hmm. He seemed like a really nice man. He wasn't creeping on her or anything. So, according to Jody, this went on for about a year. And then James suggested that it was time for her to meet his wife. And she was nervous. (laughs) She was really worried that this wife would think that this was a real sketch arrangement. And she'd want to know who this woman was who was traveling around with her husband every weekend. But she went to the house... And she met Vivian, and she was delighted to find a warm, loving woman who gave her a very warm welcome. But she did say she was really surprised to learn from Vivian that they had a son. She'd been under the understanding that they had no children. So this is how she learned about Anthony. James had never mentioned him at all. And when she asked Vivian for more details, Vivian just said that they'd been estranged and had been for several years. That's too bad. Mm, I know. Estranged families are always kind of sad. Mm -hmm. According to the Discover documentary Kentucky Murder Mystery, The Trials of Anthony Gray, the Grays didn't really talk about their only son to anyone. They told friends and family alike that they were estranged from him and that they had a terrible relationship. He worked as a mechanic in Lexington, a town that's about an hour away from them. 
mm-hmm. but they never saw nor heard from him. But Jody's friendship with the Greys blossomed, and the Greys, lonely for their grandchildren and most likely their estranged son, came to think of her as the daughter they'd never had. So she became their daughter by name. They shared holidays, their deepest secrets, and she was part of the family drama, all of the ups and downs, even the ones that included Anthony. Jody didn't actually meet Anthony until 2006 when he started coming around. She didn't think he was a very likable fellow when they finally met, and it was clear his parents didn't trust him, although they did allow him back into their lives. So what was Anthony's childhood like, and do you know why they became estranged? Well... It looks like Anthony had a fairly typical childhood. His dad worked full-time at IBM. His mom worked as a part-time teacher, so she was a substitute teacher. A lot of women take that substitute teacher track because they want to have time with their child. They want the summers with their children. They want to be there for them after school. And that's what it looks like she was doing, was devoting her life to her son and using the career to help them have a little extra money. I'm pretty sure that's what happened here. But after their murders, Anthony started describing his childhood as lonely and framed himself as a neglected boy who was constantly home alone late into the nights as his parents continued working and left him to fend for himself. To hear him tell it, he probably had to potty train himself and teach himself to walk. So you don't really believe his story? No, I don't at all. Not based on the facts surrounding it and all of the source material. I'm pretty sure his mom was home most of the time. This is a fairly conservative evangelical family, and they had very traditional family values. And I'm sure Anthony knew that fact wasn't going to help his case, so he was looking for ways to garner public sympathy. And what better way than to call your parents neglectful of you when you were a child? Everyone feels so bad for you. Yeah, that is kind of manipulative, though. And very Anthony. Do you know how they became estranged? Mm Mm-hmm. After growing up, Anthony had married a woman named Amy Bray, and they had two sons. Some people say that her boys were named Charlie and Darwin, but her tombstone lists her boys as Tony and Darwin. So somewhere along the way, Charlie's name was changed. Okay. Anthony wasn't set up financially, so the young family moved into a trailer in the back of the Grace property. But Amy fell ill and mysteriously died on March 27, 1993, which was not even a year after the birth of her last son, Darwin. That's so sad. Yeah, and really odd for a woman who is 20 years old to suddenly die. So I tried to find out what had happened there, but I couldn't find any information. Oh, okay. So we've already got a suspicious death. I think so, but no one's ever said anything about it. (laughs) After Amy's death, Anthony lost interest in caring for his children, and then he became abusive. Oh, no. According to the Lexington Herald leader, Anthony was sentenced to 12 months in jail for child abuse. One month was spent in jail, 11 on probation, on a conviction of aggravated assault. Rather than have the children enter the foster care system, James and Vivian sought custody of the boys, which is fairly typical. If there are family members that can take the children, they usually will place them with family. Mm Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Mm Mm-hmm. And they began to raise them as their own. So is that why he was mad? Because they got his children? I'm still not sure what the fight was about. They had some kind of disagreement, and he decided he was going to punish them by taking the kids away from them. He called family services and made some serious allegations against his parents, and DCFS decided to remove the children from James and Vivian's home. The boys were placed into the foster care system, And Anthony quickly relinquished his parental rights in 2001. So the boys were adopted by an unrelated family. James and Vivian were devastated, as well as humiliated. And Vivian became severely depressed. 
And this deep betrayal is what caused the rift between Anthony and his parents. That would be horrible to have your grandchildren given away permanently. Right. They've lost those children forever. Mm -hmm. And they tried to find ways to see the children, and of course the new family wasn't having it. They needed their family to be intact. Mm -hmm. So, unable to visit the boys, James and Vivian decided they would have the last say. Um, One thing that isn't talked about a lot is they did somehow get visiting time with the boys. I don't know if the boys were allowed to come visit when they were older or if the family finally relented. Mm -hmm. But later in the story, you'll see that Charles is known to have been at their house. Oh, okay. But they wanted the opportunity to care for these grandsons that had been stolen from them. And they wanted to ensure that the boys would be taken care of in the long run, which would be a way to let them know their grandparents and know that they were loved. Mm -hmm. So they changed their wills, naming Charles and Darwin as the beneficiaries of their estate and leaving Anthony nothing. Wow, I bet that made Anthony mad. Yeah, it made him really mad when he found out. They had tucked their new wills and their revised life insurance policies into their safe, relieved that the boys would at least come to know them at some point in their lives, even knowing that this would be after their deaths brought them solace. But it was the best they could do. That's a really sad story. It really is. I can't imagine that longing. Mm -hmm. Anyway, two weeks before they were murdered, they sat down with Jody and told her about the changes they had made to their wills. And they asked her if she would be willing to be the executor or administrator of their estate. She agreed. And they also decided to share this with Vivian's brother, Robert Jones. So they were making sure that everyone knew what the changes were in their plans. Mm -hmm. Vivian said she would be leaving Anthony some brass baby shoes, some baby teeth, and $20 in travel money so he could make it to her funeral. And that was it. Ooh. I guess she had a little bit of a temper herself. I think that there was a lot of bitter feelings there. Yeah. But they made a critical error. They had recently decided to let Anthony back into their lives. He'd Mm. approached them. And they kind of wanted the satisfaction of seeing his face when he realized he'd be disinherited. So they invited him over for a chat. And like you thought, that news didn't go over well at all. It's so dangerous. You should never tell children what's going to happen with your money when you die. Mm Mm-mm. Never. On the way back home from that meeting, Anthony told his girlfriend, Rosa, that he planned on getting everything when they died. He was going to get that money regardless of what his parents wanted. He'd make sure that that new will didn't matter at all. What Anthony didn't know was that his son that he'd abandoned, Charlie... Mm-hmm. was at his grandparents' home that evening. He'd only had an interest in maintaining a relationship with Vivian and James, so no one had bothered telling Anthony that Charlie was visiting and hiding out to avoid seeing Anthony. Well, Charlie heard the entire fight over changes in the will, and he became a witness for the prosecution during Anthony's trials. He knew this man's true colors. Wow. Wow. Okay, back to the day of the murders. So while the police were in the house collecting evidence and investigating, Jody was outside with a growing collection of neighbors hoping to find out what had happened. She wanted to know if her mother was even in the home. Jody approached the police who confirmed that James was in the house and deceased. She pressed him to find out if her mom was in the home and if she was okay and the police would not give her any information at all. She, of course, contacted Anthony and told him he needed to get over there right away because his dad had been shot and she wasn't sure where his mother was. Did the police tell her that Vivian was dead and in the house? Eventually, they told her that Vivian had been shot and was inside the house, but they wouldn't tell her whether Vivian was alive or dead at the time. That sounds horrible. Mm Mm-hmm. So, Anthony appeared on the scene and stopped to chat with a couple of neighbors as he made his way to the investigators who were still in his parents' home. This is about 11.30 in the morning. 
and his neighbors were fairly bothered by what he was saying and how he was reacting to this unfolding case. I know everyone grieves in their own way and reacts in their own way, but this is really, really unusual. This is what the neighbors had to say during the trial as per the Discovery documentary. Blaine Colson testified that Anthony seemed a bit detached and emotionless. What really struck him was that Anthony had expressed his delight at the thought of how rich he would now be and that he would never have to work again. Wow, that's pretty cold. And also foolish. Again, nearly a million dollars is not a lifetime income for most people. No, but it's really odd that he's saying this at 1130 before he even knows if his mother is dead. Wow. Theoretically. Yeah. He mentioned this several times during his short conversation with Mr. Coulson. Teresa Coulson testified that she kept expressing her condolences and he awkwardly ignored her. He responded by saying he was relieved that he would never have to work again. He said he needed to get over to the shop right away and get that paperwork of who owed his dad money so he could start collecting. Wow. And then there was another neighbor, Dennis Justice, who also testified that he'd seen people have more sympathy for a dead dog than Anthony did for his newly discovered dead parents. Well, or parent, since it wasn't clear if Vivian was alive or dead at that point. Well, it's pretty obvious he thought she was dead. Oh, I think so. Well, once he reached the officers, things even got weirder. Officer Pursley, a detective sergeant who was managing the crime scene, said that Anthony didn't show any emotion. He didn't ask them how it had happened. He didn't ask when it had happened. He didn't ask anything. He didn't even ask after his dad or his mother. But he did start a little story about how the murders probably happened because some drug-hungry kids had probably come into the house to rob them he told the media that his parents' home had been ransacked, although who could tell based on the mess it was in? Why was it in a mess? Well, the parents were possibly collectors. Oh, the junk shop. Uh Uh-huh. They had the junk shop across the street, and although it looked like the house had been rummaged through, the entire house was in complete disarray. There were dishes, papers, planters filled with thriving plants, half-eaten food, and other products that were piled three to four layers deep on every available surface in the home. The floors were stacked with boxes and piles of items. The house was filled to the brim. Even the porch was filled with their treasures alongside plastic animals and old gates that were no longer in use. This made it very difficult to determine what should be collected as evidence and what should be left behind, and it was even more impossible to decide if the home had been rummaged through. So where Anthony got that story from, who knows? So what did they find? Well, they did find that there was no sign of forced entry and that Vivian had appeared to put up a fight. She'd gotten as far as their gun cabinet, and she'd even gotten it unlocked and opened. The key was still in the lock in the open door. And that's when the murderer had gunned her down, before she could actually arm herself. James was found dead in the living room, too. All of the guns were still in the house, and even though the house was in complete disarray, the guns were meticulously lined up in the cabinet and hadn't been touched. So did the police think that this was a robbery? No, they didn't think it was a robbery at all because James had $480 in his pocket. So that, along with the no sign of forced entry, told them that there was probably a different story here. That makes sense. But I do have to wonder why the gun cabinet was in such good shape. Um, we talked about them being possibly hoarders. Mm Mm-hmm. But you did point out that he has that shop across the street, the junk shop. Mm -hmm. And I had a friend once who ran an EB shop selling items out of her home. They had to buy and sort and store all sorts of stuff for that shop that they were running from their house. So even though she was a very tidy housekeeper, the house always looked in disarray because they were sorting and pricing and trying to see what they had of value that they were collecting from all of the garage sales. 
Oh, okay, so maybe the plates of half-eaten food were just lost in there? Maybe. That part's a little harder to explain, right? Yeah. Yeah. So some of it makes sense, some of it, mm, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, but the pictures of it are pretty bad. But it looks like certainly not a robbery. No, because the guns were still there. Valuables were still there. And cash. A yeah. whole lot of cash. Yeah. There was a lot that was there. Well, the coroner appeared on the scene to do his job. And the investigators seemed to have left for a bit. Hmm. Because to their dismay, the Scott County coroner released the murder scene over to Anthony at approximately 5.30 p.m. that day. Well, that doesn't sound like the proper protocol. No, and then it got even weirder. Before leaving, the coroner asked all those people who were standing out around in the yard trying to find out what was going on if they would like to come in and help clean up. Ew, that's not sanitary even. No, and that's a crime scene. Yeah. Mr. Gabbard, who's a neighbor, says he donned a pair of gloves that were offered by the coroner and helped clean up blood for a bit, but he didn't have the stomach for it. So he left. I mean, it's just not appropriate to ask people who aren't trained to clean up a crime scene. And it's not a good thing to be asking them to clean up a crime scene before the investigators are finished. But the investigators, it kind of looks like they just went, oh, five o'clock, time to go home and And abandoned the crime scene. Right. And this is a really small town. They didn't probably have a lot of experience with crime scenes. But Mm -hmm. come on. Yeah, that's horrible. Yeah, well... Not one to waste time, Anthony quickly put his girlfriend, Rosa Rowland, to work cleaning up that crime scene along with everyone else. But Rosa wanted to get some cleaning supplies after a bit, so she and Anthony got in the car and headed for home. Anthony also had some big plans. So he'd shooed the neighbors out of the house and shut the house up so they could go take care of their business. Okay. So what did the police do with this mess? (laughs) Upon hearing what the coroner had done, they scrambled to correct this blatant error. They ascertained that Anthony had already been given access to the home, and they immediately called Anthony to tell him that permission had been made in error and was rescinded as of that moment. The investigators went back to the house. They resealed the crime scene to preserve any possible evidence. They strung police tape around the home again and literally taped the doors shut stringing yellow tape across the doors in a zigzag fashion. They attempted to contact Anthony a couple of times, but they couldn't get him to pick up. So they left messages on his cell phone advising him that the crime scene had been resealed and he was legally compelled to stay out of that house. Wow. A lot of evidence must have been lost. That crime scene was totally contaminated. Mm -hmm. Especially with everyone in the neighborhood tromping through and trying to clean it up. I'm surprised the coroner would be so irresponsible. I know, but I'm equally surprised at the investigators. They just left in the middle of the investigation. I mean, where did they go? If there's no overtime in the department, you'd think they'd at least assign some nighttime police to continue working on collecting the evidence. Especially if the dead couple's only son showed up and was not expressing concern or curiosity about what was going on. Yeah, that's really bad. I mean, people came in and cleaned up blood, turned lights off and on, just moved everything around. What an investigative nightmare. I know, especially because they needed to ascertain a time of death. And you can see if the lights had been switched in the on or off position to kind of help back up what you decide. So all of that was just gone. Yeah, they don't know if it happened even after sundown. Mm Mm-hmm. But they decided they'd return in the morning to see what they could salvage. They didn't know that Anthony had other ideas. Later that evening, Anthony returned to the scene of the crime along with his girlfriend Rosa and her nephew. He had brought along some personal items and wanted to move right into the home that evening. Oh, the day that his parents were murdered, he wants to move into the house? With blood still everywhere. That's awful. 
but the crime scene tape was blocking the door, so, at Rose's urging, he called 911. He was again advised that the home was a crime scene under investigation and that he was not to enter the home under any circumstance. Finally, he agreed to wait and contact Sergeant Pursley in the morning. Then, he hung up the phone and blithely cut the crime scene tape and the three of them spent the evening in the house. He and his girlfriend sleeping in his dead parents' bed. That's really gross. <laughs> um, yeah. He called Jody the next morning from the Gray's landline. Upset, Jody hung up and called 911 to inform the police that Anthony had spent the night in the home. That is so bizarre. It's beyond belief, isn't it? It's like he's trying to get caught. Mm-hmm. It's, he's trying to mess up the crime scene for sure. Yeah, that's probably what he thought he was doing. Well, I think he had something else in mind, actually. But the police picked Anthony up and he claimed he hadn't received any voicemails until that morning. But he couldn't explain why he'd ignored the orders given to him via the dispatcher. The police kicked everyone out of the house once again and reestablished it as a crime scene. And then they began to go through the house in earnest, looking for evidence or uncompromised evidence. Ah, well, there's probably not much left, but at least they're looking. Mm, yeah. It was sometime around this time that Jody, aware of her duties as the named executor of the Gray's estate, asked the police to get into the safe in the basement to retrieve James and Vivian's wills, as well as their life insurance policies. Wait, the basement? <laughs> yeah. The police who had been combing through the house for evidence had missed the fact that this house had a basement. How do you miss an entire basement? Well, to be fair, the basement stairs were hidden behind a secret wall panel. Oh, that's kind of cool. Mm -hmm. James and Vivian had not wanted outsiders to know that there was a basement in this home. They kept a small safe in the basement, and that is where they kept all of their important documents. And that is when they noticed the safe containing the revised wills had simply disappeared. Wow, that's crazy. Mm-hmm. I guess we know why the nephew was brought, right? Right, they needed some muscle. Mm-hmm. So let's talk a little bit about estate law before we go any further. Oh, okay. So I had you research it a little bit. Um, tell me, I know every state's different, but tell me generally what happens when someone dies and the will is missing. Well, um... That depends. Let me ask you a question first. Okay. Why doesn't their attorney have a copy of the will? I think that what they were doing was they were creating what's called a holographic will. A holographic will is when they write it down, they have witnesses, and they call it good. They don't make copies. They tell everyone their intent, like mm -hmm. the brother and Jody. And the will is valid. Oh, yeah, because they wrote it themselves. Mm -hmm. in their own handwriting. So I think that that is what they did because there was no attorney who stepped forward and said, oh yes, I've been taking care of their financial needs plus this and this. These people had a lot of money, but they were somewhat unsophisticated in their thinking. Okay, so they didn't think they needed a lawyer. They thought that their will was just safe in the safe. Which it was safe in the safe until the safe was no longer the safe. <laughs> <laughs> or safe, right? Yeah, so, of course, we're pretty sure that Anthony and his girlfriend's nephew hauled the safe somewhere, but could he get in the safe? It doesn't sound like his parents trusted him, so I'm betting that he didn't have the combination. And you would most certainly win that bet. In the summer of 2006, when he had started coming back around, Vivian, Jody, and Anthony had been in the basement of the home working on the air conditioning. Jody recalled Anthony had asked Vivian for the combination to their safe. Vivian had said, and this is a quote, No, you don't need to have that. First chance you get, it would be empty. So she really didn't trust him. Mm -mm, she didn't. And Anthony had pressed further, saying, Well, someone should know it. If you and Dad die together, someone could get it. Crazier things have happened. You never know. 
Wow, so he was planning it way back then. Uh Uh-huh. Okay, so what did the police do about this safe? Well, they confronted Anthony about the missing safe, and he denied he was even aware of the existence of the now-missing safe. Even under sworn oath in probate court, he claimed he didn't even know they kept a safe in the house and said he knew nothing about the purported safe. During his final trial, this is kind of a spoiler, sorry, he was asked again about the safe in the basement. He didn't deny the conversation where his mom said he couldn't be trusted with the combination. He just claimed he hadn't been paying attention to anything he'd said that day, nor had he been looking for a safe as he was concentrating on the air conditioning. So he kind of skirted the issue. Okay. So anyway, the safe is missing, the will is gone, and now is when we need to know what usually happens when someone dies without a will. So tell me what you learned about a state law. So it varies state by state, but in most states, it's pretty simple if both parents die and there's no will, and there's only one child. It's all going to flow directly to that child. But first, it has to go through something called probate court, where you go through a process and you get together all the information about all of their debts, all of their assets, things like titles and deeds and all of those very important but not very exciting things. Okay. So... There was no way that the children who had been adopted into another family were going to end up with a penny. No. It would all go directly to Anthony. Which is what Anthony had told Rosa. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the investigators started investigating and a couple of Anthony's ex-girlfriends came forward to say they thought Anthony was the murderer. Wow. Cynthia Neal said Anthony didn't like his parents at all. He told her his parents were abusive when he was a boy, and he'd taken the children away from them to ensure they couldn't abuse them, too. He forgot to tell her he'd actually abuse them, not his parents. He told her in 2005 he needed to reunite with his parents because they were sick and should be passing away soon, and that he wanted to be there when it happened so he could get all their money and possessions. He also told her that if his parents didn't go fast enough, that he might have to push them. Wow, 2005. How many years was that before the murder? Two. Okay, so he really had put some thought into this. So, yes, so it looks like when his mother fell ill... He decided it was time for them both to go. Mm Mm-hmm, and he decided he needed to be in the picture to ensure that he got everything. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, Cynthia didn't believe that his parents were abusive, and she didn't believe that they would ever have abused his children, and that's why they'd been taken away. She knew his parents, and she was fairly certain that they didn't do anything. She testified for the prosecution at his trial, as did another ex-girlfriend, Tammy Kidd. Additionally, a cellmate came forward and said Anthony had confessed to him that he had committed the murders when he was in the Montgomery County Detention Center. That's a pretty solid case they were building. Um, it sure looks like it. So what did the second ex-girlfriend, Tammy Kidd, testify about? She told the investigators that Anthony had wanted to kill his parents way back in 2001 when they had become estranged. Surprised at what he was saying, She had asked him if he'd thought about how he'd do it, and he told her yes. He would get a gun, and she would have to drive the getaway car. He would go in the house and shoot his parents, then he would run back to the car, and they would hightail it for home so they would have an alibi. Stunned, she said, are you serious? And he responded, yes, he was serious. He went so far as to drive her past their house and describe in detail how it was all going to work telling her that she would be his alibi. But of course, she wouldn't do it. Seems like a good reason to break up with someone. I think so. He would admit to this conversation at trial, but he said he didn't really mean it. That's interesting. The police, of course, had Anthony on their short list of suspects, given everything they were learning. They had pinpointed the night of the murders to be April 24th. They found them on the 26th. 
Okay. Okay. But Anthony swore up and down that he was at home with Rosa all night on the 24th. He insisted he was not their man. But Anthony was actually lying about that. On Tuesday evening, Rosa and Anthony had argued about Judy Lucas, and Rosa had gone to bed angry, slamming the door behind her. Rosa was pretty sure Anthony had left that night and then returned home later, but she said she couldn't prove it because she'd gone to bed. But Rosa's daughter, Brittany, remembered that evening very clearly. She said that after her mom and Anthony had argued, Anthony had left home in their black car. He didn't return home until after she'd fallen asleep. The next day, he left town, taking Rosa with him. He'd taken her up to Butler, Kentucky to work on a forklift. He said he took her because he'd missed her and loved her and wanted to spend some time alone with her. The day after they returned was when Anthony's parents were found murdered. Wow. Mm hmm. So I think that visit to Kentucky was probably trying to build his own alibi. It sounds like it. Now remember, this happened in April of 2007. And they had quite a few suspects that they had to chase down leads for. And because he had been selling guns, they had to look at some of the shady characters in town that sold and stole and bought guns. They had to look for drug-addled children who wanted to kill parents to get drug money, apparently, and would forget to take the drug money. But in early October, the police pulled Anthony in for another interrogation. And during this interrogation, Anthony made a statement that stunned the police, telling them, You can't put me there. You can't prove it. Wow. But they were pretty sure they could. It was about that time that Rosa confronted him about the discrepancy in their alibi stories. Something was up because the conversation was taped, and it was taped very well, so I'm assuming that she was working with the police. She told him that she knew he'd left the house the night of the 24th. Despite her providing him an alibi, she wanted him to tell her the truth of what happened that night, and he straight up gaslit her. He said, and this was a quote from the tape, I was home with you and Brittany and Brandy and everybody, but I was home, baby. I never went nowhere. You know where I was. Don't question yourself about me, okay? Everybody knew that he wasn't there. He was hoping that Rosa would provide a solid alibi and he would be fine. Yeah. But on October 20th, the investigators asked Anthony to drop by the precinct to talk about a forged will. And when that was cleared up, they asked him if they could ask him a few more questions about the murders. And he said yes. But here is where the investigators made some critical errors. First, after taping each and every interrogation that they had conducted for this case so far, they now left the cameras off and conducted a five and a half hour unrecorded interrogation with Anthony. During this interrogation, they allegedly showed him a photo of his car time stamped for the evening of the 24th, telling him that they had him at the scene of the crime. They also told him they had a witness who was willing to testify against him and they informed him they had found blood spatter on his work uniform and gun residue on the steering wheel of his car. They told him they had him dead to rights, but all of this is untrue. The investigators don't have to tell you the truth during an investigation and they were trying to force him into a confession. Okay. So this part of the investigation was actually valid. Investigators are allowed reasonable leeway when trying to elicit a confession, but then they crossed the line. They showed him photos of the crime scene, and you'll have to watch the video yourself to see him fake cry when discussing his seeing these crime scene photos. It's very instructional. They taped the photos to the wall to keep him focused on the murder, and they told him they had a judge on the phone, and if he refused to confess, they were going to go for the death penalty on this case. Anthony alleged that this actually happened. Both of the investigators denied that this happened at all. Okay. But 
The investigators then excused themselves from the room to give him a minute to think. They gave him 30 minutes, actually. And when they returned, they presented him with, and this is where they really went wrong, a signed lab report showing DNA evidence and gun residue had been found in his car. Wow, how did they get that? They forged it. Oh, no. And that's what they're not allowed to do. This is where they'd push that envelope too far. You can't forge documents. The police can lie to you quite a bit, but they can't forge documents. And they can't tell you they've got the judge on the phone. The forged documents were deemed to have exceeded reasonable leeway later after he was convicted. And this is why he ends up with a lot of appeal rights. Oh, okay. But this did push Anthony over the edge, and he did confess that night. The investigators turned on the recorder to capture his confession, and he told them he and Rosa had gotten into a fight and he had gotten into his car to cool off. He made the one-hour drive to his parents' house without even really thinking about going there, and he arrived at about 9.30 p.m. He said he sat down to talk to his dad, and then the terrible accident happened. He claimed his dad had brought a firearm into the room, and he didn't remember how or why, but he suddenly had it in his hand, and then a fight broke out among the three of them. He said he couldn't remember what the fight was about. He claims at some point he either blacked out or his dad could maybe could have hit him. Yeah, he probably hit him, and he stood up and shot him from behind several times. Then he turned around and shot his mother. Then he shot his father one more time and ran out the door. But of course he reiterated he couldn't remember it because it had been like a dream. He thought he was blacked out. He drove home as quickly as he could, throwing the forty-five caliber handgun out the window as he drove. He seemed to think this blackout story was going to get him a break. He'd been very careful to say he felt terrible about it. Remorse? Check. And that is when the police knew they had their man. But Anthony wasn't quite finished playing his games yet. Right after his confession, he called Jody and said, they told me I did it, so I guess I did, but I don't remember. Jody was so upset she'd hung up on him. That's a horrible thing to say, and how petulant. Mm Mm-hmm. It's his game. It's part of what he was doing to try to get out of it, I think. Mm Mm-hmm. Anthony has since complained that he should not have been interviewed at all because he had an attorney. What he fails to mention is that attorney that he had, Fred Peters, had only been retained to represent him in probate court. He had never been retained to represent him for any potential criminal charges. Oh, so he didn't really have an attorney at all, even though he keeps pressing that and pressing that. Yeah, you can have your own attorney who represents you in all things, or you can have a limited relationship with an attorney. Mm -hmm. So this Fred Peters wasn't someone who generally represented him. He was just his probate attorney. Okay. Which is usually not the same attorney as a criminal attorney. That's very true. They have very different skill sets, don't they? Mm Mm-hmm. So, in 2012, Anthony was tried for the murder of his parents, but that resulted in a mistrial due to a hung jury. Oh. So the case had to be retried in 2013. And Anthony testified at that trial, claiming the police had coerced a confession out of him and that he was innocent. The confession was allowed into trial, and the defense were denied the chance to present a theory which names an alternative perpetrator. Can they do that? Can they decide, no, you can't present this in court, if that's what the defense wants to do? Sometimes, yes. It's not done very often because it leads to appeal issues, Mm -hmm. but it can be done. Okay. So after deliberating for 11 hours, the jury was ready with a verdict. They found him guilty, and he was sentenced to two 20-year terms to be served consecutively and then an additional five years for having tampered with the physical evidence. 
so altogether 45 years. Hmm. His legal team immediately appealed in February of 2013 to the judge to have the judge set aside the verdict. The judge refused, so they next appealed to the Kentucky Supreme Court, and the conviction was eventually overturned in 2016 because the confession should not have been allowed to be presented and the alternative perpetrator theory should have been allowed. So Anthony was moved back to jail from prison in order to await his new trial. So during the first trial, they said, yes, you can use the confession. They admitted it into evidence. Mm -hmm. And they told the defense, no, you can't tell us that it was someone else. Right, and both of those decisions were wrong. So now during the new trial, they don't have the confession, and the defense can come in and say, oh, we think it was this other guy? Uh Uh-huh. Okay. So this new trial was held on September 8, 2021, and he was convinced that this time he would be found not guilty. He said he didn't remember killing them for sure, and his attorneys were saying he'd been tricked into a false confession. The defense did hit hard in this final trial, contending the police had failed in their investigation. They claimed the Greys were not murdered on the evening of Tuesday the 24th and produced a couple of witnesses who thought they'd seen Vivian Gray outside the shop on Wednesday, despite there being no evidence that Vivian had been at the shop that day at all. Hmm. Yeah, a local minister testified that he heard three shots on Wednesday evening while he was mowing the church lawn, sometime between 4.30 and 6. This would have been important because, remember, Anthony was out of town fixing a forklift that night. But the minister couldn't say for sure if the gunshots had come from the Gray's property or even from that direction. He didn't look into it because, he conceded, the sound of gunshots was pretty common in the country. People used guns for target practice all the time. I guess that makes sense. So it will depend on the jury. They'll have to decide if the jury has enough information to say if that's beyond reasonable doubt or not. Uh Uh-huh. But they also had to deal with the alternative perpetrator theory. Okay. The defense worked hard to turn the story into one about how James was shady and made shady deals with criminals. Hmm. Again, the classic blame the victim. Mm Mm-hmm. They claimed that a man named Peter Hafer, kind of a local character, was responsible for the murders. Another man, Harry Hoover, claimed Peter Hafer had told him he'd shot both of the Greys and then headed to the basement to break into the safe, but the safe was already missing. Oh, that's really weird. Mm Mm-hmm. Another felon, Ray Yarnell, claimed Mr. Hafer had admitted the murders to him, saying Mr. Hafer had stolen guns two months prior in preparation for the murders. And then Anthony had taken the stand, claiming he'd been tricked into confessing. But he probably undermined himself on the stand because he also testified that he'd broken into the sealed house the night of the murders because he wanted to sleep in his mother's bed to find the comfort he'd found there in the past. Oh, so gross. I know. And this story, despite the strong evidence, he hated his parents with a passion. That makes no sense at all. It really doesn't. And it just makes the jury think, "Mm, I don't know, that doesn't seem right. Mm -hmm. He also denied even knowing about the safe or having any conversations about it. But mostly he complained while testifying about that false confession he'd been forced into. Okay, wait a minute. The truth of the matter is, that wasn't a false confession, right? No, the only way in which I think that confession could be construed as false is that he obviously didn't go over there without a thought to commit murder and then somehow end up with a gun in his hand and then somehow shoot them in the back. Mm-hmm. You can't make a false confession at all, though, if you actually did the crime. The defense was trying to call it a false confession, but it's not a false confession if it's true, even if it's forced. His claim was that it was a coerced confession or an involuntary confession. But the defense attorneys seemed to conflate the idea of a coerced confession and a false confession into one. That if it was coerced, it was false. And that's simply not true. Oh, I can see how that would be a good strategy for them, though. Mm Mm-hmm. But investigators 
like these can make errors during an investigation in an attempt to compel a confession, but it's not a fault confession if what is confessed is true. A fault confession is something you confess to that you didn't do. He may or may not have been tricked or coerced into confessing, but that is not a fault confession if he actually did do the crime. Makes sense. So, this is why the trial was so important. By excluding the confession from this trial, the focus was on the evidence at hand, rather than some confusing semantic argument. Okay, that makes sense. And I'm glad that they actually redid it so that they could look at the evidence without the confession. Yeah, and then also allowing the alternative perpetrator theory gave the defense the opportunity to try every avenue to show their client was, in fact, innocent. Mm -hmm. But that trial didn't end well for him at all. Oh. The prosecution had Brittany, his girlfriend's daughter, mm -hmm. who testified he'd left the house that evening and then lied about it. Charlie, his oldest son, who had heard his ex-father explode upon hearing the will had been changed. Mm -hmm. Rosa, the girlfriend, who knew he'd lied about his alibi and knew he'd said he would be getting all of the money when his parents died. So they had Charlie, the neighbors, the cellmate he confessed to, and the ex-girlfriends. They didn't have Anthony's confession, but they had been able to use that confession to fill in the blanks regarding the murders. Moreover, they had a jailhouse phone call to a friend on the outside, wherein Anthony had confided that he'd committed the murder, saying, Well, you know I did this. Oh, wow. Yeah, he was pretty bold. Which did not work out well for him. Anthony was convicted again of both murders based on the evidence, and despite the absence of his coerced confession and the defense's use of an alternative perpetrator theory. The prosecutors had enough evidence to convict Anthony of first-degree murder, and Anthony's younger ex-son, Darwin, spoke up for him at the sentencing hearing, asking the judge to go easy on Anthony so he could maybe one day get to spend some time with his dad, a dad who had never given him the time of day and had physically abused his children and then ditched him. But even this coercive ploy didn't work. That really upsets me that they reached out to these boys and tried to get them to defend him. Yeah, it just really seems like taking advantage of some very vulnerable young boys. Mm -hmm. So, Anthony was surprised to find that he would have been better off keeping the results of his first trial intact. This time, he was sentenced to 55 years in prison instead of the 45 he received in his first trial. <laughs> So, prison is where Anthony still is today. That makes sense. So, how was it split up? Well, he was given 20 for dad and 30 for mom. And then the additional five years for messing up the evidence. Oh, so were they saying dad may or may not have been a crime of passion, but mom was most definitely intent? Do you think they're talking about first degree versus second degree? Yeah, there must have been some difference in the murders, but I'm not sure what it was. Okay. Well, that is a risk that defendants often forget about. With the results of the first trial thrown out, you might end up worse off when you're sentenced for the second time. I know. They think they're always going to be better off, but that's not always the case. Mm -hmm. So even though Anthony ended up receiving an even harsher sentence, the second trial took its toll on the family who remained. Mm. Vivian Gray's brother was devastated at the loss of his beloved sister. He was subject to the roller coaster ride created by the mistrials and appeals. That would be so hard. I know. Trials are devastating for family members, and having to sit through three full trials and listen to how his own nephew had murdered his sister and brother in law in cold blood. And then watching this boy try to demonize them in order to avoid detection was horrid. Mm. He said that he was glad to have the third trial over with, and he was happy enough with the results, but he really hoped this was the end of the gut-wrenching trials. I can't imagine. My heart goes out to him. Mm -hmm. So what happened to Jody? Well, Jody learned the hard way that, minus birth or legal adoption, you aren't really anyone's relative as far as the law is concerned. With both James and Vivian deceased, Jody didn't have much in common with the Grays. 
She applied with the probate court to become the executor of the estate, as Vivian James had asked, but her filing was quickly supplanted by their blood family members, three to be exact, Anthony, Vivian's brother, Robert Jones, and James' sister, Deborah McKitty. Oh. These family members filed affidavits specifically asking that Anthony not be named executor. I don't blame them. Yeah, and the judge did listen, and Anthony was not named the executor of their estate. Good. But luckily for Jody, she does have her own biological family. She had her own mother and her son. But in May of 2011, Jody was charged with illegally obtaining oxycodone and providing falsified records. Oh, dear. Yeah, she was convicted of four felonies incident to those charges and lost her nursing license. But it sounds like she's turned it around a little bit. She's now an embalmer and a funeral director at a funeral home in a nearby town. And based on our source records, she does not keep in touch with Anthony, Charlie, or Darwin. Charlie and Darwin are out there living their lives. We are going to report on where they are or what they're doing because they're very incidental to the story since they were adopted into another family. Mm -hmm. Did the boys actually end up inheriting? Do you know? From the limited records we could locate, it appears that the James and Vivian Gray estate has an established trust which still holds most of the wealth they accrued while alive. We hope, but could not verify, that their wishes were honored and the two boys inherited. We do know for sure that James Anthony Gray will never inherit the estate because of the Slayer Laws. Good. Yeah. A niece of the Greys made a statement to the Lexington Herald leader during the court procedures. She said... Everyone is both disgusted and saddened that someone from our own family did this. It's not the kind of family that we have. Oh, wow. Yeah. I kind of couldn't believe the statement when I heard it, but I understand the emotion behind it. Because this woman doesn't understand parasite at all. Mm -mm. She's in exactly the kind of family that raised a child like this. Most of the families of parasite offenders are filled with good people who try hard to raise good, law-abiding children. The Grays did not ask to be murdered, and neither did the parents of Tyler Witt, Nikki Reynolds, Chandler Halderson, Tyler Haynes, Peter Zimmer, Jenna Smythe, Amber Bray, or Derek Klaus. Many good parents from virtually all walks of life have died at the hands of their children, and that is why the Parasite Prevention Institute exists. That is the entire point. It can happen in the best of families. Very true. So, I guess we need to thank some people. Okay, well first, we need to thank Jade Brown for the music. Mm-hmm. And the Kentucky Murder Mystery, The Trials of Anthony Gray. The News Graphic, Court TV, Find Law, Lex 18 News... Lexington Herald Leader, and thecrimeaholic.com for the information and pictures that we used to bring you this story. And we need to thank you, our listeners. Thank you so much for lending us your ears and your support. If you'd like to lend us financial support, you can find us on Patreon, or you can donate on our website. And we would shower you with gratitude if you choose to do so. And stickers if you ask. Absolutely. If you'd like to meet us in person, we will be at CrimeCon in Las Vegas next weekend. That's right. See you there. This has been the Parasite Podcast. And remember, always sleep with one eye open. Ashes, ashes, we all fall down. (laughs) 